I would like to welcome you to the very last panel of this conference. It's the last one, and it's definitely not the most easy one, but it's a very important one. And so I'm very glad that you're still here and still want to hear and discuss with us. Difficult legacies, a topic that has been discussed already, for example, in art museums for a long time, and is also of major importance to natural history collections as, for example, cases of repatriation in London, Berlin, or Vienna recently, or in the last decade, have shown. But there are also still a lot of cases where institutions hold human remains or natural history objects that were required in contexts that need much more research and much more visibility. So in this panel, we have different case studies um, from 2012 until till ongoing, still ongoing. And um, we will try to yeah, lean in and engage with practices of naturalization, but also counter practices of like decolonizing natural history museums. So we will have just um, for the order of things, um, questions after each talk. And we still have one and a half hour <laughs> to be fair to everyone. So first, I'm very happy to introduce to you Birgit Ahrens, which I actually don't have to introduce to you anymore because you know her already from yesterday. And she's an expert in this field here. We were discussing now because she's working as a curator and in, in research too. She has studied curating con contemporary art at the Royal College at Art in London and has curated the contemporary art program, as you just heard, in the Natural History Museum. Uh, but also in the Natural History Museum in London for eight years, from 2005 to 2013, uh, which is an international uh, residencies program from which we will hear later also. And she continues also to work in London, currently in the research department at the Science Museum. Thin since 2013, she has also been a doctoral uh, rate scholar at Royal Hol Holloway, at the University of London, where she's working also on a project of, like, let's say, at the intersections of contemporary art, archives, and environmental change in the art age of the Anthropocene. <coughs> Today, it's also kind of a Heimspiel, perhaps, for her, because since um, she's also currently curating two of the visual art uh, commissions at the Naturkundemuseum, but her talk today goes back to her London time and to the Australian Sydney-based artist Dan Daniel Boyd, if I pronounce it correctly, <laughs> and his, uh, his installation Up in Smoke Tour from 2011. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing about decolonizing the Natural History Muse Museum through contemporary art. Thanks, Marike, for the nice introduction. It's nice to be called an expert. I don't think I've ever called myself an expert in anything. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I hope uh, you enjoyed this afternoon session, last one. And uh, I would just like to encourage you uh, later on in the discussion, don't be polite. Uh, these projects are interesting with working with human brains in, in museums. And uh, I would really like to hear your thoughts on it because there's not one way of doing it. We're all having a go at seeing how to resolve difficult situations. So my case, so my case study today, Daniel Boyd, Up in Smoke Tour. I explain the title a bit later. Decolonize a natural history museum through contemporary art. So my, my case study is about becoming participants in history, not merely recipients of its imagined legacies, about becoming actors, not bystanders to history. And I'd like to preamble this uh, talk um, with a quote by anthropologists and historians Edwards and Meads. We say, which histories are told and how, and which histories are not told and why. This is what this talk is really about. And it is based on my work at the Natural History Museum in London, where I was curator of contemporary art between 2005 and 2013, and during which I commissioned many different projects, different shapes of projects, to engage with the museum's collection, scientific research, and the role of the museum in today's society. So this specifically looks at um, how we're familiar with the histories of colonization written by Europeans and also how that is transpired in the Natural History Museum in London in particular, in a subject area that wasn't really addressed until 
um, about 2004, 2005, until you couldn't avoid the topic any longer. And I was glad to be at the museum because it was good to pick this up through the intervention by a contemporary artist as well. So through the program, through the contemporary art program, but while there were lots of cultural changes going on at the uh, Natural History Museum, we invited Aboriginal artist Daniel Boyd from Sydney in Australia to address this imbalance of perspectives some 240 years after Australia was colonized by the British. So Boyd sought to acknowledge the loss of information that occurs as a result of history being told solely from the point of view of the colonizers while the perspective of the colonized is omitted. So I like to show this through the examples of the Natural History Museum and the work he did there, but I need to establish a little bit his artistic strategy, so that's quite important, just to look at his artistic strategies, and I will um, look at that before we get to the work at the Natural History Museum. So the story of the colonization, I'm actually going to show you an image as well. Here we are. The story of the colonization of Australia by the British starts with Captain James Cook. In 1770, after anchoring HMS Endeavour at Kundu, Cornell, now Botany Bay, Cook had dubbed the Australian continent Terra Nullius, a land owned by no one under European law, and claimed it for the British Crown. Sir Joseph Banks, a wealthy young man, was a botanist on board, and eight years later, he was elected president of the Royal Society, which is of the premier British Science Society, set up by Newton when he argued for the setting up of Australia as a penal colony. And this is how it happened. 11 colonizer ships set sail from the UK to Australia, known as the First Fleet, and arrived in Varane, Sydney Cove or Port Jackson, now modern day Sydney, uh, and arrived in January 1788 to set up the colony with about 1,500 convicts, government officers and marines with their families. So just to introduce Daniel Boyd briefly, he's a key proponent of a thriving Aboriginal art scene, lives and works primarily in Sydney, uh, and with vigor explores and now very um, strong Aboriginal art scene in, in a, in a, exploring their cultural identity and contemporary politics. He works primarily in painting, but more recently has also explored time-based media and created video installations and sound works. He often reworks archival imagery and history paintings. You see an example here, which I talk about in a minute. Made by Europeans to construct a history of Australia from out here, signaling a contemporary Aboriginal standpoint. I will talk about how Boyd addresses national history and natural history, how he deconstructs ideas about land, colonial relations and encounters, and ways of seeing. So he says, shifting the proposed view of Fox's painting, which this is based on, and I'll show you in a minute, to something that was an indigenous per person's perspective, allowed me to challenge the subjective history that has been created. So Boyd's strategies are to incorporate present day and subjective identities to interpolate personal histories into national historical narratives, and thus to take ownership of his own and his people's history. In his work, Boyd probes how colonial images inform contemporary society and how we interact with them. He more specifically questions the romantic notions that surround iconic images of key figures of colonization through painting. Known portraits by George III, who was um, the, the king while the colonization happened, Captain James Cook, who I mentioned earlier, Sir Joseph Banks, president of the Royal Society and Botanist, and Arthur Phillips, the first governor of New South Wales, are appropriated and reworked, often undermining the gentleman's gestures with implications of lawlessness and theft. This process allows Boyd to relate dispossession and colonization to his own contemporary experience as an Aboriginal from the peoples of Kuchala, Eastern Kuku, Lanunji, Kangulo, Jagara, Banjalung, Kuku Jongan, and the North Pentecost Island, excuse my, my pronunciations, from North Pentecost Island, Vanuatu, peoples, and to reclaim his own history, I'll get a lesson from Janet later. <laughs> um, so I will discuss two of Boyd's major paintings. We call them Pirates Out Here, which we see here, which was acquired by the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, and, um, and then the painting Sir No Beard from 2007, and then followed by the installation Up in Smoke Tour 2011 at the Natural History Museum. So through these works, I try to explain the strategy of decolonizing 
in Boyd's work and how this relates to the Natural History Museum. And by decolonizing, I refer to revisiting and challenging institutional taxonomy, scientific practices, and colonial impositions while speaking out for cultural multiplicity and recognition. So this painting here, we call them Pirates Out Here, is sort of made to look a bit like a, a, a postcard and out here referring to his standpoint from Australia. Uh, it's, a brightly recolored it's a brightly colored retake of the painting by E. Phillips Fox, Landing of Captain Cook at Botany Bay, 77, which was made in 1902. So, yeah. So it's a, it's this, his painting and Vice of Game have also spot the difference, really, so which we're gonna play now for a minute. So Boyd's painting imitates and mocks and parodies inviting direct comparisons between the iconography of the two paintings. So Fox's paintings was commissioned in 1902. I think it was painted in Britain. So it's a complete, you know, it's a fictionization of history. It's a fictionization of how Cook encountered um, uh, the land in the Eura peoples who then lived in the Sydney area. So it's uh, a painting of Cook's landing, who we see here. Um, and they're encountered with the indigenous community. Um, okay, mach um, weiter. So in, I would like to discuss Boyd's painting first, which is there on the far left. So Cook um, is presented danke, as a pirate. He's got an eye patch and um, he's a Swedish botanist, David Daniel Solander is right behind him carrying a parrot on his shoulder. I hope you can see that. Um, and the face of the man who's holding the flag, which Daniel Boyd refers to as the Jolly Jack, uh, is modeled on one of the artist friends who also came from England to Australia. Um, on the right-hand side, you see Fox's painting, um, and there are two local men. Yep. They're barely discernible, as barely discernible figures. Um, in Boyd's painting, um, because he's transmuted them into plants um, by the colonizers, indigenous Australians who were called, referred to as, um, well, they were compared to these two plants. They are native grass tree plants, which you see on the far left. Their scientific name is Santuaria. And so the colonizers like to refer to the indigenous uh, Australians as black boys, which you can see there on the right. So the meaning of this transportation, two men changed into natural features in the landscape. Daniel, through this, uncovers an unsettled so-called naturalized, that is accepted, ways of seeing or accepted ideas. Here he refers to the not seeing of Aboriginal people more generally. This refers to, according to historian Nugent, Cook's alleged failure to recognize indigenous people who Cook encountered as human. This, in Nugent's opinion, is an unfair charge. However, it's an idea that has currency in contemporary views. Cook failed to see the local people as sharing his own humanity. And in this case, in Boyd's painting, he doesn't see them at all. Instead, Cook sees the place empty of people, hence the notion of the terra nullius as well, the land owned by no one. Moreover, Cook saw this place as a botanical wonderland, as enshrined in the term Botany Bay, which was conferred to the era by Cook. And it was yet another way of making the inhabitants fade from view. This became Cook's place. He took ownership of it through naming it and through choosing what he sees and what he doesn't see. In the meantime, Joseph uh, Banks, um, who you can see behind Cook, um, Joseph Banks, um, points not with fear to indigenous figures, in Boyd's painting that is, but sees the botany of the place. He points to the two grass trees, which is his botanical collection to be. So I now continue with Joseph Banks. Banks accompanied James Cook on his voyages to the South Seas. 
could afford it. Um, and um, again, we're playing this game of uh, spot the difference. So you've got um, the historic painting by Benjamin West on the right, and then you've got Daniel Boyd's retake on the left. So Banks here, because he traveled to the South, he's shown here with some of the first objects that reached Britain from New Zealand. Um, there's a Maori cloak he's wearing, a tire is stuff, and a wakaho, which is a paddle, which you can see there as well. This painting is in, the, in a gallery in Lincoln in the UK. Um, and on the left, the retake by Boyd, it says Sir uh, um, Nobeard. Um, and again, he surrounds Joseph Banks by the uh, artifacts he collected, but a double portrait. So the painting not only portrays the president of the Royal Society, uh, a position Banks held for 42 years, between 1778 to 1820, but also represents Boyd, his severed head in a jar, which I can see, show you on the detail there. So why did Boyd place his head in a jar? And why is he a specimen included in the portrait of Sir Joseph Banks? In his work, Boyd seeks to the continu continuity in Aboriginal history. So I just have to hark back a little bit to a correspondence Banks had on 8th of April, 1803. He wrote a letter to the then governor in Australia, Philip Gidley King, and writes, the manifold packages you've had the goodness to forward to me have always, owing to your friendly care in addressing and invoicing them, come safe and in good condition to my hands. Among the last was the head of one of your subjects, which is said to have caused some comical consequences when opened at the customs house, but when brought home, was very acceptable to our anthropological collectors and makes a figure in the museum of the late Mr. Hunter, now purchased by the public. The decapitated head that caused comical consequences, but was acceptable to the anthropology collector, belonged to the Aboriginal resistance fighter Pamelwoy, leader of Bichigal, the River Flat clan. He ambushed and fatally speared Governor Phillips convict game hunter John McIntyre. Pamelwoy was outlawed by Governor Phillip in November 1801 and shot dead on 2nd of June 1802. His head was severed and sent to Joseph Banks, making the botanist more than just a plant collector. The head was in the collection of the Hunterian Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons in London during the 19th century, but its whereabouts are today unknown. The head remains a concern to Australian Aboriginal people today. In early 2010, Prince William, current royal family, on a visit to Australia, pledged to Aboriginal elders to support them in their quest to find the skull. By replacing Pomeroy's head with his own, Boyd creates a continuation of Aboriginal history of the past 140 years. He also alludes to the current divergent perceptions of the reaction of the Aboriginal peoples to the white colonizers. Did the Aboriginals simply fade away, or was it a fierce battle? Boyd's paintings reframe the individuals of the age of reason. In these paintings, he questions the search for knowledge enabled through scientific methods and colonization. So now to, um, so having established his principles of working and his interest in uh, archival and historic imageries and his interest in the importance of specimens, I want to now discuss the, the work that he did at the Natural History Museum, so um, up in Smoke Tour. Um, this is Daniel Boyd. And so um, up in Smoke Tour refers to uh, a gangster rap um, tour um, a few years uh, before 2011, but it also refers to the um, habit of um, young European gentlemen to do the, um, the grand tour in the 18th and 19th century. So it's a, it's a, it's a double take. Um, so Boyd spent about three months at the, at the Natural History Museum researching the so-called First Fleet Collection, which was drawn up in the First Fleet London. There were three artists on board who were drawing um, topographical drawings, portraits, and so on. But he was also encouraged and did uh, research other parts of the collections, and in particular the Human Remains Collection became quite important to him. So the program of which Re Boyd's residency was part was a partnership between the Natural History Museum London and the South London-based studio organization Gasworks. 
the museum was the locus for the research and the commissioned work. It was clear that he would do a work for it, and there was also a space for it. And Gasworks provided a studio space for the artist, um, which provided a peer environment to him. He could do his work there, he could also do different work there, but also created a different forum um, for engagement with different audiences. Um, his residency, by the way, is part of a series of residencies where we invited artists, international artists, from geopolitical areas um, from which the museum holds significant collections which relate to a history of trade, science, and colonization. So, let me just have a look. This is uh, one of the works from the First Fleet, so you just get uh, an, an idea of roughly what these works, but about um, thousand odd works in this, in this collection and quite often they're not known by whose hand they are, so there's all just, did, they get put under this header, Paul Jackson Painter. Um, and this was the space that was already earmarked as a space where he would do his installation. As a reason for that, there's a gallery which is called Images of Nature, and where we would show the first feet collection, and the, his commission was supposed to be within that exhibition space. We had thoughts and discussions around um, making the work bigger somewhere else as well, in addition to you, but there wasn't enough budget, but there were thoughts about that. So, um, but then actually it was quite useful to have the limitation of this one display cabinet to do something with that. So it's a, an Edwardian cabinet, it's not original to the architecture, um, and it obviously imposes some spatial and aesthetic um, limits. Um, but um, as Boyd became interested in how the human remains of the Natural History Museum were stored, particularly because the museum was in the process of rehousing the collection, um, we became roaming around the museum, interested in these boxes, which you can see on the left. I show you a film in the moment, I hope it works. So I, 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 you see them off the work, it's a bit difficult to see it. And on the right hand side, I'm just saying briefly, um, Boyd returns to the theme of lost information and official versions of history. He produced a series of paintings but you can hardly see there actually, but they are uh, sort of paintings and landscapes of the Eura people. So he chose these new conservation, state-of-the-art um, archival boxes that are there to house particularly skulls, and he appropriated them by painting in black, and inside he created his paintings which reworked um, archival images from the collections or other, other images, historic images that are related to um, Vanuatu, Queensland, um, uh, um, Sydney, and so on. And he had particularly had sculptures from Vanuatu in there. So the works are framed by these conservation boxes, painted in black, and then he uses a particular technique where he starts to obscure the image by applying a, a translucent dots, dots to it. Um, so he obscures the image underneath to, to um, exemplify the loss of information. So I hope we can see this film now. The reason that I had an interest in the human remains is to see if there were any possible connections to individuals here. Um, relating to my ancestry. I was given a tour of the conservation unit at the museum, and currently they're reboxing the human remains collection. So state-of-the-art conservation grade boxes have been designed by the museum uh, to house the, the collection. The old boxes that I've used in my installation, they're powerful, potent objects, even without the skulls or the bones in the boxes. With the new boxes, I'm using the lid and the tray as a framing device for the works that I've created while I've been here in the residency. I'm using the old and the new boxes to show that there is this process of change in the way that the museum is dealing with the individuals. It's a way of showing that there's some kind of empathy towards individuals in the collection. By incorporating human remains boxes, Daniel Boyd references in his installation the large number of Aboriginal portraits included in the First Fleet collection. 
he also draws attention to the human remains collection held at the museum, of which several hundred are from Australia. We've got about 20,000 sets of human remains within the museum, from a single bone or a single tooth to a complete skeleton. They are scientifically very important. Everything you do leaves a mark on your bones, so we can tell something about their health, about what that person did in life. Some communities did sell remains to Europeans. However, in many cases, there is no consent at all. They're just being taken. We're trying to work it with, with all of the communities that we have remains from who have made claims for return. We're trying to understand the sorts of issues that they have and to have an exchange of ideas with them. What I'm trying to do by using both boxes is kind of adding to this, um, this new dialogue that the museum is having with repatriation of remains. By appropriating the imagery and using use as well as disuse boxes from the human remains collection, then it references the trauma that the Aboriginal communities experienced through the hands of the colonizers. He creates a gesture of defiance, but also an affirmation of his own cultural identity. We also had fun. <laughs>